My name is Kieran. Um, I've been the technical lead for AirGrid on the Celtic Interconnectors since late 2018. So we've been developing uh, the project in conjunction with uh, the team in AirGrid and the team in uh, France, uh, Ortea, Raise the Transport Electricity. Um, and tonight I'll, I'll bring uh, an update on the Celtic Interconnector itself, what it is, how it's been developed, what it consists of, um, and I'll give the, the latest status um, in terms of going forward now as we enter the construction phase. Um, I will also give a little brief overview on the technology that we're going to, to use. We, we now have um, contractors on board um, following the, the, the recent procurement process. So I'll give a brief overview of the specific technology that we will use. Um, and as I say, we'll, we'll go through the next couple of steps. So I'll begin with um, who is developing the project. Um, I'm not sure would everyone be familiar with who AirGrid are, um, but for those who may not be, uh, just a, a brief slide to say that we are the transmission system operator for Ireland, um, responsible for the, the safe, secure, reliable supply of electricity here uh, on the island. Um, we develop, manage and operate the electricity transmission grid. We don't own the assets, uh, the ESB own the transmission assets, so we are the TSO, ESB or the, the TAO. Um, Part of our remit is we're mandated to explore and develop opportunities to interconnect the Irish system with other systems. Um, and at present, we, we do that with the East-West Interconnector, which is a 500 megawatt connection um, from Meath to Wales. Our project partner uh, for the Celtic Interconnector is Ortea. So they are our equivalent in France. Um, the difference for them being that they also own the assets. So they are the TSO and the TAO. Um, they would be responsible for the operation, maintenance and development of the French system. So you can appreciate that the French system compared to the Irish system is uh, significantly larger. They have about 105,000 kilometers of power lines and almost 3000 substations. And they are greatly interconnected with Europe. Um, they're, they're not like ourselves here on the Western edge of Europe. They have ties to Belgium, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, uh, also to Great Britain, and they have further interconnection in development in parallel with the Celtic interconnector as well. There's a, a further interconnection uh, slightly behind the, the Celtic project uh, to Spain, the, the Gulf of Biscay project as well. Okay, so what exactly is this Celtic interconnector? Um, it's a HVDC interconnection linking the transmission systems of Ireland and France. So the transmission system here in Ireland consists of AC electricity. This is a DC electric electrical connection, and it will be the first between Ireland and France. Jointly developed by Airgrid and RTE. Um, I think the first uh, feasibility or mention of this was that I could find was 2009, an interconnection feasibility study. And it's been in the AirGrid business plan since 2012, or mentioned in the AirGrid business planning since 2012. It is a project of common interest since 2013. Um, and that means it's been identified as one of the key infrastructure projects to integrate Europe electric, European electricity and gas markets. It's also got the dual designation as a, a European e-highway priority electricity project. Uh, and what that means is it's um, identified as a project to drive down the, to meet the European low carbon economy goals. So it's one of the few projects uh, to have achieved that dual um, classification. In terms of what the, the interconnector will, will be, uh, this graphic is a very simple way of depicting it. Effectively, it's made up of, of three main components. We have the land element in Ireland, the submarine element across the Celtic Sea, and then the land portion in France. So if I, if I work from left to right, our grid connection point will be the Nakraha substation uh, just beyond Glanmire there on the, the northeast side of Cork City. We will have a, an 11 kilometer section of AC cable at 400 kV to a, a new converter station at Ballyadam and Carrick Tool, just to the west of Middleton. Um, 
And that converter station is where the process of the conversion from AC to DC or DC to AC, depending on the, the flow of electricity will take place. There's approximately 32 kilometers then of land DC cable to our landfall point in Claycastle in Yall. From there, there is a 500 kilometer, 497 I think to be precise, but 500 kilometers of subsea cable to the Northwest coast of France. Um, where the, the cable will come ashore and there will be 40 kilometers then of DC land cable to um, the converter station in France, which is the Armourzer converter station. And that will connect into an existing 400 kV substation called La Martyre in Brittany there in Finisterre. Um, very simply, um, there's a couple of electrical parameters here then that, that I will run through. So the, the power capacity of the interconnector is 700 megawatts. Um, that's not an arbitrary figure that was, was chosen. That's the output of some very detailed design studies in terms of what the grids in Ireland and France are capable of handling. And I think it's important to note that the comparable scale of the Irish system versus the French system, 700 megawatts is a significant infeed to the Irish system. At the moment, the biggest single infeed that we have is the EWIC interconnector. And that's 500 megawatts. So the, the studies that were undertaken have identified 700 megawatts as the optimum capacity that the grid can handle without driving significant further reinforcements of the system. Um, the AC voltage then for the connection on the Irish and the French side will be 400 kV. So that, that section of 11 kilometers of AC cable will be 400 kV. And similarly in France, it will be 400 kV. The DC voltage um, will be plus and minus 320 kV. So there will be two DC power cables laid, one at positive polarity, one at negative polarity, 320 kV relative to ground. Um, 320 kV is, I suppose you could deem it an industry standard for an interconnector with 700 megawatts capacity. You can have a higher capacity power transfer and you can have a higher voltage level. But for a 700 megawatts, 320 kV would be more than capable of, of what is required here. More importantly, it has significant service experience at that level. And that's important from the cable perspective. The cable technology that we're going to use, and I'll, I'll have a couple of slides on this later, is cross-link polyethylene cable. It's an extruded cable uh, as opposed to a mass impregnated cable. Um, as I say, many years service experience at 320 kV. Some projects with slightly higher, higher power transfer capacity will have 400 kV. Uh, the market is moving towards 525 kV. But for AirGrid and the importance of this project, having proven, trusted, reliable um, technology was one of the key factors that we had in developing our technical strategy. Uh, the market is very experienced in providing 320 kV, and ultimately that was the, the, the voltage that was deemed optimum for the project. The DC configuration then of the converter and the link itself will be in a symmetrical monopole configuration. So two converter stations with two cables laid between. Again, that was the, the output of, of multiple studies. Um, and the, the converter technology will be voltage source conversion. Um, and again, later on, I'll explain why that is relative to the other option, which would be LCC. Two submarine cables uh, will be installed in the marine environment. The DC land cables will be equivalent. Um, two for France, two for Ireland, difference being slightly less mechanical protection, slightly different configuration of the cable itself. Then for the AC cables, it's three phase, uh, so three cables, and there will be a fiber optic cable laid as well, uh, with primary objective of interstation communications and monitoring of the, the power cable itself. In terms of the marine route, um, very simple graphic, um, but just to give a little bit of context here, uh, desktop studies would have been the initial approach that would have been taken here back in 2012, 2013. That would then have progressed to surveys in 2014 and further surveys in 2016, 2018. Ultimately, the output of all those surveys, which were supported by um, burial assessment studies, benthic survey, surveys, 
um, many other um, surveys like maritime traffic, etc., would have led us to the identification of, of this route. 497 kilometers. Um, the route itself avoids the UK territorial waters, but it does go through the UK exclusive economic zone. And that has had an impact on some of our planning and consenting requirements. The, the route avoids the uh, special protection areas. It does consist of a variable seabed tech topology and geology, which you can appreciate over 500 kilometers. And, and as you can anticipate, uh, conditions in, in, in the marine environment can change um, quite, quite quickly. But ultimately, we identified no major constraints, uh, nothing that's insurmountable in terms of laying that, that cable um, along the route. I have 18 in-service cable crossings uh, identified there. I think we have more, to be honest. I think I do need to update this slide. Um, but there are procedures, et cetera, in terms of how we cross those cables and, and ultimately in the future, how any other new cables would have to cross ours to maintain the security of, that, of all cables in, in the marine. Our maximum water depth is between 100 and 110 meters uh, across the entire route. So for the, the landfall points then as well, um, we went through quite a comprehensive consenting and public engagement process in terms of identifying the optimum locations for the landfall and the optimum locations for the infrastructure. Um, and without going into too much detail, they were assessed against multiple criteria and we identified the best performing options, et cetera. The output of all of that was the identification of Claycastle Beach and Yall as the best performing landfall location to connect the interconnector. Um, the main reason for that was the ease of access or the route for installation to the landfall point there. There is a, a sediment infill channel. I'm not sure how well you can see it on this slide here, but there's, a, I suppose, a, I won't say an easy route, but a, a less restrictive route in terms of bringing that cable ashore at Claycastle. Once it comes ashore at Claycastle, um, we are going to keep the cable on the roadway for the majority of the route. Um, so it will come up onto the N25 at Yall, follow the N25 primarily to the eastern side of Middleton before it skirts the northern end of, of Middleton and comes um, back around and down into the Valley Adams site in Carrick Tool. And from there, we bring the, the AC cable north westwards up here towards the existing substation at Nakraha. So as I say, it's it's on road for the majority. We have come off road uh, at the, the villages of Castle Martyr and Killa. Um, in terms of complexity, I suppose one of the main complexities we will have will be the, the HDD or the horizontal directional drilling um, under the, the rail line there at the northern boundary of the converter station site at Valley Adam. The French landfall point then, I must admit, I'm not overly familiar with it. I haven't visited it myself yet, but um, it's in the, the region of Caradenic in the near the city of Cléder. And unlike the, the Irish side, it is a bit more complicated to bring the, the cable ashore there. It it's, uh, contains more granite um, on the approach into the landfall point there. So there will be a bit of, of rock cutting required. Um, I'm sure they're a little bit envious of our silt infill channel on the Irish side. They, they have approximately 40 kilometers then of DC land cable before they approach their converter station site at Armour's Air. Um, again, I suppose sl slightly more of their cable will be off-road. 70% uh, will be within the road, 30% on farmland. They again would have complexities along the route. Um, they have some river crossings and railway crossings to deal with. Um, and some of the soil conditions on, on the, the Brittany coast, um, you will encounter some, some granite and some harder soil. So some of the installation techniques will, will differ between the Irish and the French side. Okay, so just to, to bring it back a little bit, why is it? Um, I suppose that the project is being developed at all. Um, where has it come from and, and what are the benefits that it's going to bring? So maybe just to, you know, I mentioned it in passing earlier on, but 
ultimately, as a system operator, we are responsible for maintaining the security of supply uh, for Ireland. And part of that license as TSO would be to explore interconnection with, with other countries. Um, and I mentioned that we'd been exploring this since I suppose the earliest part was 2009. Um, it, it's fair to say that Ireland at the moment has low levels of interconnection. We have 0.95 gigawatts, so 950 megawatts consisting of the Moyle interconnector, 450 megawatts between the north of Ireland and Scotland. And we have 500 megawatts, um, which is the EWIC interconnector from Meath to Wales. Um, so 0.95 watts or 0.95 gigawatts uh, it, it would be considered low levels of interconnection. Um, we are currently below the EU electricity targets of 10% by 2020 for interconnection and 15% by 2030. Um, and with the UK leaving the European Union, we presently have 0% interconnection with the, the EU. We also trigger three of the European Commission's thresholds, which are designed to identify the need for urgent development of interconnection. So our annual yearly price difference is greater than two euro per megawatt between countries or regions. Our capacity is below 30% of peak load and our interconnection capacity is below 30% of installed renewable generation. So there's quite a mandate there to explore and develop interconnection between Ireland and, and other countries. From the French perspective, there's also a pressing need for this as well. There, uh, the ambitions of the French government in their 2018 multi-annual multi energy plan set out requirements to prepare more flexible and carbon-free energy systems and promote and uh, enhance the development of renewable energy sources. In terms of the, the objectives and the benefits of the, the Celtic interconnector, Celtic interconnector there's three that I will, will touch on today. Um, first one being improving the market integration. So Celtic will directly connect the single electricity market in Ireland with the French electricity market and consequently the EU internal energy market. This will facilitate increased trading resulting in downward pressure to the cost of electricity for consumers. You may not be able to see it very clearly on this slide, but there is significant price differentials um, between markets. And you can see here the price differential per megawatt hour. I think this slide, I, I pulled it out from the third quarter of 2021. We see 156, almost 157 euros per megawatt hour in Ireland versus 97 for France. So significant differentials between, between the markets. Um, the Single electricity market in Ireland has recently completed a major transformation as well to comply with European target models for electricity. And connecting the Irish um, system into the European market will ensure Ireland's Irish consumers benefit from this transformation. So multiple benefits from the market integration. We will also increase competition in the energy capacity and ancillary service markets and ultimately provide benefits for the Irish consumer. Secondly, enhancing the security of supply. So ultimately, we're, we are diversifying um, the fuel mix and introducing a large power supply. What that means is we have a facility now to provide black start um, capabilities. So if a, a, a significant event occurs on the Irish system, we can use the interconnector to start that system back up again and, and to bring the system back online. And we have flexible services for voltage support um and frequency support so the the interconnector can be used in what's known as stack com mode um in the event that it's required so we can provide reactive support to the irish system and in the event that we require additional um, generation or electricity to meet our demand to to provide frequency support the interconnector can be used to do so as well one Important point to note is that as we move towards a less carbon intensive future um, and a less carbon intensive generation mix, this can't be optimized at the expense of security of supply. So at the moment, we cannot have all of our demand met by renewables. So we do need to have the facility of an interconnector available to us in the event, you know, as we push the limits for non-synchronous penetration, allowing more wind onto the system, Having the interconnector there will allow that reduction, I suppose, in conventional generation and, and the promotion of renewable generation, but 
but the interconnector will allow that security of supply to be maintained as we put as we diversify the mix um, moving forward. The third benefit that I'll talk about tonight is the increased use of renewable energy uh, sources. So here in Ireland, we have one of the largest renewable capacities in Europe. Um, our onshore capacities have increased over the, the, the last number of years, and the offshore wind capacity is about to take off. Um, there's a large amount of gigawatts of offshore winds going to be brought onto the system in the future. And ultimately, in the absence of having an interconnector, we would face difficulties in utilizing all of this renewable resources. Um, so by allowing for sustainable development of the wind energy in Ireland and um, meeting the French objectives for decarbonization of the French energy mix, the Celtic interconnector will be a significant enabler of this. It will also enable the facilitation of the Irish government policies, which is the achievement of large amounts of renewable power on the Irish system as we move towards the 2030 and 2050 targets. A very brief slide on how it is that the project has been developed. Um, as I say, we, we've, we've come through a number of, of milestones since 2011, 2012, and, and the project has been developed in phases. It has had support uh, from the EU throughout, and a number of uh, stage gates, let's say, where the viability of the project was reassessed, reconfirmed before we, we designated more uh, resources, more, more effort into development of the project. So the period from 2011 to 2014, we, we really looked in detail at what benefits the project could bring, what's the technology there to deliver uh, on those benefits, um, and what would some of the likely costs be for the project. Moving into 2014, on into the next period to, through to 2016, we started some of the marine surveys. We started to really define some of the project parameters that, that I spoke about earlier in terms of what the electrical parameters were going to be, and more in-depth analysis of the economic and financial uh, aspects of the project were explored, uh, and a large number of reports were produced. As we moved on then, we entered into what was known as the IDPC phase, so the initial design and pre-consultation. And, and I suppose this is the point where we started the identification of where the infrastructure could be located um, on the Irish side. And we went through extensive public consultation, identifying a number of landfall points, a number of potential converter station locations. Um, we further developed the initial design with our counterparts in France. We did some market analysis, market engagement with the likely suppliers for the equipment, understood their manufacturing capabilities versus our project timeframes. Um, a lot of engagement and consultation with the regulators, both in Ireland and France, so Crew and Cray. Um, we submitted the investment request, um, whereby the project benefits were, were set out to the regulator and ultimately accepted and the cross-border cost allocation was the output of that process really where the, the regulators determined that the project was viable and it should be developed in, in such a way between RT and Airgrid and the regulators made a, a number of decisions on, on how that should take place. We also achieved a significant milestone within this period which was the SINEA grant funding application so the project received uh, 530 million of EU monies towards the development. So at a European level, the, the importance and significance of the project was recognized. The, the application was successful and I stand to be corrected, but I think it was one of the largest grant applications um, provided for a project of, of this nature. What's, uh, well, since 2019 then to 20, well, I suppose we're in this phase now, that there's an interim phase here, which we, we called ourselves the detailed design and consent phase, but ultimately since 2019, we developed the consenting application and submitted to onboard Planola uh, here in Ireland, uh, successfully granted um, earlier this year. There was a number of other consenting or planning applications that needed to be submitted foreshore licenses. We had to apply to the Marine Management Organization in the UK for the purposes of laying the cable within the UK exclusive economic zone. And similarly on the French side, there's, uh, I suppose, 
I won't I won't try and pronounce the French, but the equivalent on board Planola um, requirements were, were were met on on the French island. A large part of our efforts as a team uh, since probably January 2020, uh, and a large part of the work stream that that I've been involved in um, was the procurement process, whereby between Airgrid and RTE, uh, the joint venture that we have called CDAC, um, we developed the project technical specifications. We held supplier events and ultimately issued um, an OJU notice, um, whereby we issued an invitation to negotiate or an invitation to tender out to the market for the scope of services that are needed to deliver the Celtic interconnector. Um, that process, I, I probably have a slide on this later on, but that process started at the, I suppose, Q4 2020. Um, the OG notice was published. Uh, we launched the procurement then uh, with, with the ITN in April 2021 and went through the rounds of procurement tendering, et cetera, to ultimately secure our contractors uh, following the analysis of their tender offers and multiple technical, contractual, commercial clarifications with them. Um, and ultimately, we've, we've come to the point where uh, we have awarded the contracts at this stage. And I'll, I'll, bring, I'll come on to those slides. But yes, that's been a significant part of the work since 2020, really, is the, the procurement and securement, securing the contractors to deliver the works in line with our requirements uh, and specifications. As we move forward, then we, we effectively started the construction phase as of last Friday. Um, we, we, we've transitioned into the construction phase. We were presently organizing our kickoff and our working arrangements with the contractors. Um, and my, my final slide will, will give a brief overview of how that will, will take place over the course of the next four years, leading us towards the energization then in 2026. So I, I touched on this there, um, consents or, or planning requirements were required across three different jurisdictions, Ireland, France, and the UK. Um, we achieved our uh, consenting here from on board Planola in May. Um, very thorough process, um, very um, comprehensive environmental impact assessments completed, um, on board Planola reviewed and, and granted with conditions which would be as per standard that we will have to comply with. Our foreshore license was granted in August. Um, our, the MMO license from the UK in September and all French consents were put in place uh, in September. And that allowed us then to take that final step with the final investment decision uh, in November and, and move forward to that contract signature. So I mentioned the, the procurement process, but just to give a brief overview, we, were, we have two EPC contracts, so engineering, procurement, construction, um, one contract for the cable manufacturing uh, installation, cable manufacturing laying installation, um, and that is for both the marine uh, environments and the land cable in Ireland and France, and that is inclusive of the AC cable. So one contractor delivering the marine cable, the HVDC land cable, and the HVAC land cable in Ireland. There is a short section of AC land cable in France, but that is being delivered outside of the EPC framework that will come from an RTE internal uh, framework. And then there's two converter stations for France and Ireland and a, a cable ceiling and compound on the Irish side as well. So two EPC contracts, and then we are also putting in place enduring um, maintenance contracts. So on the Irish side, we will have a what's known as an LTSA, a long-term service agreement for the, the maintenance and operation of the converter station in Ballyadam and the cable seating and compound. On the French side, they also have an LTSA, slightly different scope of work, uh, given the resources that RTA or TEA have uh, with their own maintenance crews, et cetera. Um, and there are multiple interconnectors. They, they have maintenance crews that can do the annual outages and all of the preventative maintenance um, across their sites, whereas here in Ireland, we will use the LTSA contract. On the cable side, then, we have what's known as a, an inspection, maintenance, and repair contract as well, and that's a, a joint undertaking between Ortea and Airgrid. 
All of that ultimately led to an event uh, in Paris last Friday, um, whereby contracts were awarded. Um, very significant event at the Irish Embassy in Paris, attended by both the French and the Irish energy ministers and by Michal Martin, the Taoiseach. Pictured with the handshake there is the Air Grid Chief Executive and the RTE Chief Executive, um, with some EU representatives as well. So very, very significant moment, a lot of effort when you consider 10 years in development to just get the contractors in place um, and a large construction program ahead of us now, but just a nice picture to put up, I thought. <laughs> so ultimately, um, through the procurement process, um, very competitive procurement process, we have secured our contractors. It is quite a specialized um, area of electricity transmission, and um, there are a couple of main players in the market. Um, we did, as I say, have a, a competitive procurement process um, from April 2021, which has brought us to November 2022. Siemens Energy uh, were awarded the contract for the converter stations in Ireland and France, um, and for the AC cable ceiling and compound in Ireland also. And then Nexons um, were awarded the submarine cable, the land cables in Ireland and France, the AC land cable in Ireland, and the fiber optic cable system um, linking the converter stations between Ireland and France. So we're very pleased to have contractors on board and to be moving from this phase of the project into construction. Okay, so I, I put a couple of slides here just around HVDC technology. Um, I'm conscious that not everyone in the room is an electrical engineer. Um, so forgive me if there are terms that I use um, that may not be familiar, but uh, I will take questions afterwards if there, there's anything um, that anyone would like to expand on. But ultimately, what is HVDC? And in its simplest form, it's the point-to-point -to -point, point -point transmission of bulk power. Um, what I've indicated here is a symmetrical monopole configuration, which is, is what we are going to install for Celtic. Power can flow in both directions, and depending on which direction it is, you will have a, a rectifier a converter station acting in rectifier mode and a converter station acting in inverter mode. And at the point where you convert from AC to DC, that's your rectifier converter station, and where you convert the DC power back to AC, you're inverting it back, and that, that station is termed the inverter. It is bidirectional and flows on the Celtic interconnector will be bidirectional. At points in time, the flow will be from Ireland to France. At other points in time, depending on market conditions, depending on system needs, the, the power can flow from France to Ireland as well. There are, I suppose, two main types of HVDC transmission. Um, the, I suppose, the, the longest enduring one is the, the LCC technology. And the newer one to the market, albeit it was 1997, I think was the first application of it, uh, is voltage source conversion technology. There are a couple of subtle differences between LCC and VSC, um, but I'll, I suppose what's consistent between both of them is that they both rely on switching. So from the point of conversion at the rectifier and at the inverter, you are switching away from or switching between DC and AC to generate your AC or DC waveforms. The switches used in both of these technologies differ. So for LCC, you're using a thyristor and a thyristor um can be switched on at any point but it relies on an external network synchronous network for the turnoff point so you can you can control when it commutates or conducts um but you cannot control when it turns off it turns off at the, the zero crossing point so lcc relies on a connection to a, a synchronous system um and isn't particularly then suited to connection of a remote renewable generation or for black star conditions. VSC then uses what's known as an IGBT, an integrated gate bipolar transistor. And this offers more flexibility in that you can control the turn on and turn off of that switch. And it allows you then to pick your points on the DC or the AC where, where you, you, you conduct basically and generate your AC or DC 
um, corresponding waveforms. Um, I think, yeah, just looking at my notes, power reversal um, and some of the limitations of, of LCC. With LCC, in order to change the, the flow of direction, you need to change the voltage polarity. Um, and that really limits the, the type of cable technology that you can use. LCC typically, typically uses mass impregnated cable because that instant or instantaneous or quick change of voltage polarity is not suited to the XLPE cable. Whereas for VSC, you, to change the direction of power, you just change the direction of the current. And that allows the use of the XLPE cable systems. Um, VSC technology has multiple advantages. So as I say, self-commutation, the ability to turn on and turn off the, the switches, the IGBTs, allows for the independent control of the active and reactive power. Uh, no limit on short circuit capacity. So it, it doesn't need that connection to a, a synchronous system. Um, it, it can operate in a passive system and it can be used to restart a system that is effectively blacked out, which is a, a great feature to have. The transformers that would be used in a, in a VSC converter station are very similar to your standard AC transformers. Um, they aren't exposed to the harsher DC stresses that an LCC transformer would be exposed to. So there's a, an efficiency in terms of the transformers that will be used. LCC technology would have some quite harsh harmonics and power quality issues. Um, VSC technology, and in particular, the, the latest developments of VSC technology um, remove the need for some of these filters and, and reactive compensation. And as I say, with, with VSC, we can have power reversal almost instantaneously by just the, the current reversal. Um, ultimately, I guess the, the easiest way to explain it is, is one converter station maintains um, one converter station controls the DC voltage steady to a known value. And the other converter station adjusts the DC voltage at that end. And that's what causes the current to flow in one direction or the other. It's the relative DC voltages. I realize in this slide, I almost have it backwards. Um, I start talking about the modular multi-level converter, but in reality, what I, what I should be talking about here is the evolution of BSC converters. The diagrams at the below at the bottom are probably the best way of describing it. We have two-step converters, three-step converters, and modular multi-level converters. And ultimately, what you see is um, with a modular multi-level converter, we have a, a better representation of a sinusoidal AC waveform as the, the output. Two-step converters ultimately um, they switch between the positive and negative of the DC. Um, and, and you use that, you do that using your switches, but in a pulse width modulation method to generate uh, quite a harsh square wave, really, to be honest. If it was a pure square wave, it would be unmanageable, but the pulse width modulation gives it uh, a representative, it, it might look quite square there, but it, it's, it's a representative sinusoidal waveform. And that does require a lot of uh, filtering um, to ensure that the power quality uh, of that AC generated AC onto the system doesn't have a negative impact. For the three-step converter, you're introducing uh, the zero point. So instead of switching between positive and negative, you're switching between positive zero and negative. It, it has the, um, I suppose, it has more IGBTs within it, um, but it does improve on the two-step in that the, the generated AC waveform is more representative than a, a two-step converter uh, of the sinusoidal. But you can see the modular multi-level converter. Um, effectively, what's that, what that is doing is that it's, it's switching, instead of switching between positive and negative, uh, positive and zero and negative for the three-step, you're switching in and out capacitor banks. So you're, you're, you're making smaller switching steps. The gradients are less, and that allows for um, a smoother AC voltage profile. So you're reducing the amount of harmonics and, and high frequency noise that's in there. Um, it does, I suppose, have some drawback in that the complexity of the control system to be able to do that, monitoring the status of, of the, the valves themselves, 
uh, is quite a complex um, control system, but you can see the, the benefit. Um, ultimately, what we have from Siemens Energy is their HVDC plus modular multi-level converter. Um, that is their, I suppose, standard VSC application. It has quite a number of years service experience, um, which is an important factor to us as well. Um, and I go into some more detail here, just bear with me, on what their modular multi-level converter looks like. It consists of three identical phase uh, units, so one, two, three, with two converter arms within each. You can see the converter arm here in blue. And each converter arm contains a number of modules, main, which are made up of towers, which themselves are made up of tiers, which themselves are made up of submodules. So if I come on to the slide, it'll give you an illustration of what a tower looks like. Um, each level within there is known as a tier. Uh, and each tier will contain six submodules. And in each in those submodules, you will have uh, a power module and a capacitor. And the power module will contain the control um, hardware, the IGBT switch itself, and you will have the capacitor. So I mentioned that with the, mul the modular multi-level converter, we're switching in and out banks of capacitors to give that gradiated voltage profile. Um, and these are, are all connected together. Um, the amount of tiers, the amount of submodules depends on the application, um, depends on the level of redundancy that the customer requires, depends on the maintenance interval that the customer requires. So it's quite a flexible solution. It's modular. It can be expanded out to various power capacity levels. Um, but certainly the, the control algorithms within here, we're, we're talking significant complexity. In terms of the, the Irish converter station, then this is a, a plan view um, of the tender proposal, let's say. We, we'll enter into the detailed design now, but, but here you can see on, on this side, we'll bring the DC cables in. So two cables will come in. We've got our uh, reactors here, our DC reactors. And then we have our converter arms, modules, tiers, submodules, power modules, capacitors all contained within these blocks here. Um, we come out then through some AC reactors onto the transformers. So we have three single phase transformers uh, and a spare unit, which will be on site in the event of any failure. So one of the key aspects for this interconnector is reliability and availability. So should an issue arise, we need to be able to bring the interconnector back on stream as quickly as possible. And having that spare unit on site it won't be an instantaneous return to service if there's a transformer issue, but it will be certainly reduced. And if we have to ship a transformer from Germany or from France, if it's stored on the French end. Um, so that, that would be one of the features that we would have set out in the specifications. We then come out into some AC switch gear. We've got some pre-insertion resistors for uh, purposes of energizing the, the interconnector. We have, uh, AC shunt reactor here, which is to provide some reactive compensation for the 11 kilometers of AC cable that will link the converter up to Nokraha. Um, control building here is, is where the, the complex control systems will be housed um, and any of the other um, hardware, I suppose. We've got cable monitoring hardware going in there as well. We've got your, your standard AC and DC distribution supplies for the station contained within there as well. And one of the key components will be the, the cooling system, which is up here. Um, so we have cooling banks. The, the conversion process uh, within the DC converter hole here generates uh, quite a bit of heat and that needs to be maintained at, at below certain thresholds. So having cooler banks um, out here uh, facilitate that. Spares is a, an integral um, component. So we, we have spares storage and maintenance building down here. So we will store strategic sections of land cable within the converter station site in the event that they are needed in the future. Um, we will have a separate facility, a joint facility with Ortea for submarine spares. Um, but any of the equipment uh, needed to, to keep this converter station operational 
um, will be will be stored here in this building. And then we have the, the cable terminations here where the AC cable will go off. Uh, I think our, our HDD point is just off the screen here up to the Northwest. Okay, so that was the converter station technology. For the cable technology then, um, I mentioned the marine surveys that we did before. Uh, a lot of, most of that data would have been issued to the tenderers at the time. Uh, from April 2021 to allow them to base their tender bids on. And that would have contained a lot of um, the thermal conditions of the seabed, the types of the soil that the cable will need to go through. And that would have determined what they would have proposed in terms of the size of the, the cable um, and the conductor, be it aluminium or copper. The, the, winning, the winning bidder, Nexans, uh, their proposal is 2,500 square mil aluminium cable for the marine um, at three, plus or minus 320 kV. Um, and similarly then for the land cable, uh, it is 2,500 square mil. Slight differences between the, the configuration of the cable from marine to land. I mentioned some additional mechanical armoring in the marine environment. It's more protected on the land, let's say um, in ducts and trenches. I should reference the fact that it will be buried in the marine environment also, but the, the mechanical stress on the cable when it's lowered from the vessel, um, we mentioned 100 meters, 110 meters of water depth, so there is more mechanical forces on that cable, and hence the additional armoring. For the AC cable, then, we also have 2500s aluminium XLPE, that should read, um, cross-linked polyethylene um, between Nakra and Valley Adam. This uh, cable is just a representation. It's, it's more of an illustration of what the various layers or components of the cable would be in terms of the sheath, the, the spacing, the tape, and ultimately the conductor in the middle itself. For the marine installation element, then, um, you can appreciate it's, it's quite a complex operation and there will be multiple steps. Um, I keep going back to our marine survey data. That's data that was gathered between 2014 and 2018. Um, conditions can change in the marine environment. So part of the, the scope of the cable EPC contractor will be to go out and, and do some specific surveys themselves on, on aspects of the route to be sure that you know, their design, their method statements, et cetera, um, their proposals for installation still stack up or maybe they need to change certain aspects based on the survey results. But I think it's, Fair to say that one of the first things that they will do will be the, the prelay grapnel, whereby effectively this will be towed along the route and will try and clear the route from fishing nets, debris, any loose impediments that can be, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not going to catch everything, but it, it will clear the, the route before the, the next step. As we go along the route, there are different types of soil, clay, silt, um, et cetera. So there are various different pieces of equipment uh, that can be used and the contractor will have put a proposal together that optimizes the efficiency of what they're doing because to change the equipment, you know, multiple times as you're progressing along the route is not an effective way to do this. You want to be able to use a tool that can meet the conditions or the majority of the conditions that you are going to encounter. So one of the, the pieces of equipment that will be used will be the pre-lay plow. So this is before the, the cable is, is laid on the seabed. The plow will be placed on the seabed and effectively dragged along the seabed um, and it will break up some of the, the areas of the seabed where there are harder or harsher ground conditions. Um, and that will facilitate the post-lay um, protection of the cable. So significant piece of equipment, I suppose having it in white here on the screen maybe isn't giving the, with the white backdrop, gi giving you the um, scale of, of, of that piece of equipment, but significant uh, to say the least. The, the next phase really then would be the laying of the cable on the seabed. And the contractor who was successful, uh, Nexon's, um, introduced a vessel to the market last year, 2021, called the Aurora. Um, a purpose-built vessel for interconnectors of this scale. And I mentioned, you know, we're, we're operating in a niche aspect of, of electricity transmission, and there are 
niche subset of suppliers that can do this, but what they can do is um, develop and build these types of vessels to meet the needs of, of TSOs like ourselves and Ortea. The Aurora vessel itself is, is quite significant. It's 150 meters uh, in length without the, the craneage um, at the back of the, the vessel. It's 31 meters in width. But one of the more impressive statistics is the, the turntable. So the, the cable will be coiled uh, on the vessel in, in this turntable with a, a bearing capacity of 10,000 tons. Now, the cable will be manufactured in, the DC submarine cable will be manufactured in Halden in Norway um, and loaded onto the, onto the vessel and transported to the, the laying sites along the route. This will be done in four different campaigns um, and we will have four joints uh, across the 497 kilometer route. So the distance between the joints over 100 kilometers between each joint, which means we're getting over 100 kilometers of cable on this vessel. Um, there will be factory joints um, which are made in there, but we, we do try to minimize, so it was a, a specific specification requirement that we minimize the number of marine joints because you can appreciate jointing in a marine environment uh, is not the best thing to be doing. Uh, you do want to minimize it. it. It requires precision. It requires a clean environment on the deck of a vessel operating in quite some harsh uh, conditions. So th this vessel is significant and it will be the vessel that will lay the cable on the seabed. Um, after it's been laid, again, depending on the, the type of soil for the, the area of the route that we are on, the route is, is broken up into what's known as KP points, so kilometer points. And the installation contractor will know you know, between KP20 and KP47, it's this type of soil, this tool will be used, etc. So all of this will be um, predetermined and the operation itself to, to lay and bury the cable will be a precision operation. So post lay mechanical trenchers um, will be used for part of the route. Um, it'll be deployed to bury the cable for the, the more onerous or the harder ground conditions. Um, and the cable will be buried up to a depth of about a meter and a half. And that's the desired uh, burial depth. So again, this equipment will be lowered onto the cable or, or above, above where the cable has been laid, effectively pick the cable up, move along the seabed and drop the cable into the channel that it, it creates behind it. Um, for the softer areas, we would use water jetting, or there's a proposal to use water jetting tool. So again, a change of the tool, depending on, on the soil conditions that were encountered. Um, but yeah, the, this, this would, I suppose, be used for the areas where we've uh, deployed the pre-laid plow. So we've effectively broken up the seabed. It's easier to to jet the water in, allow the cable to fall into the trench that's created and the sediments will, will backfill in on top of the cable and it will remain protected and buried. There are points along the route where we will cross existing cables, predominantly communication cables, but those cables will need to be protect, protected in the same way that should any cable in the future cross our cable, we would want our cable to be protected. Um, there's a number of ways of doing this with rock protection or concrete mattressing, et cetera. But this is just a, a, a profile of uh, an example of how that would be done, where you have a, an existing buried cable. The Celtic interconnector cable goes above it. We, we can't bury it at that point. So we have to protect the cable with um, rock protection or concrete mattressing. So you can see the, the width of that is about 10 meters. Um, with a, a height that I, I can't actually see there, about 1.5 meters. So quite, quite a complex operation to manufacture the cable, transport the cable, lay the cable, bury the cable, and ensure it remains protected. Once it's protected, it's, it's passive, it's inert, it, it should remain operational um, unless it's impacted by, by any external factor. Um, 
there are, I suppose, portions along the route where we have mobile sand waves, um, areas of high fishing, anchor drags uh, may impact on the cable in the future, but this is precisely the reason that we have inspection, maintenance and repair contracts to ensure that that cable never reaches the point where it becomes exposed or damaged. At the landfall points, then, we have a difference in approach for the Irish and the French side. Um, again, on the Irish side, it's, it's softer conditions. Um, we are able to use the open cut trench method, um, which involves just cutting a, 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 a trench along the beach there in Clay Castle up to what's known as the transition land hole joint bay. Um, which is where we, we transition from the submarine cable to the land cable. And this is just an illustration of what that looks like from the EWIC interconnector. On the French side, um, again, it, it's just harder granite along the French coast. Um, so they will have to use horizontal directional drilling to bring that cable ashore on the French side. So just my final slide, I hope I'm coming in on time here. Uh -huh. um, in terms of what the next couple of years will look like, um, as I say, we, we signed our contracts now. We have, I suppose, finished our procurement phase, um, for want of a better word, and we're in the construction phase. Um, we will be working very, very closely with both Siemens Energy and Nexans to keep this project on schedule. Um, and that will dictate in 2023, the completion of their designs for both the cable uh, components and the converter. We will see the start of some of the manufacturing of the Irish AC cable, and that will come from Charleroi in Belgium. We will see some of the trenching and ducting for the DC land cables and for the AC land cables in Ireland. The converter station works will, will get underway. Now, the initial part of that will be surveying of the sites and mobilization, etc. cetera, um, but it, it will commence in 2023. 2024 then we'll see the commencement of the offshore cable. Um, and yeah, one of the big issues was securing the manufacturing slots for the DC submarine cable. You can appreciate the, the market for offshore wind is expanding significantly and there's a lot of demand for, for submarine cable at the moment. So securing the slots was a, a key aspect of running the procurements in the timeframe that we did to make sure that we could have manufacturing commence in 2024 to have our, have our energization in 2020. Uh, six. Um, yeah, 2024, we'll see some of the installation of the AC and the DC land cables. And then moving on into 2025, we'll start seeing the marine activity really ramping up. We'll see the, the first of the marine installation campaigns. Um, and 2026, we'll see the, the, the third and the fourth. Um, and 2026 will be where we start making the connections between cable seeding and compounds, the converter station, um, and ultimately the DC cable linking the Irish and the French side. So we, we have a, a commissioning process that will, that will take place in 2026. We have the testing of the converter stations themselves. We then move to what's known as the interconnector system test. So that's the point where the DC cable is connected to both converters. And that's the point where we start doing some of our grid code compliance testing. Once we have completed the grid code compliance testing, during that interconnector system test, it moves into a trial operation period whereby the interconnector is placed in service um, and it will, will see variations in terms of power transfer capacity between Ireland and France. And its performance will be monitored um, with contractual obligations to be fulfilled there if it isn't before we, we take over the interconnector. But all going to plan, we go from here, start of the construction phase to 2026, where we have a, an operational interconnector called the Celtic interconnector between Ireland and France. That's the plan. <laughs> so I think that's, that's it for the slides. I'm, I'm here to take some questions. We also have Shane Cooney here from Airgrid, who will be the works package manager for the Irish works. Um, hopefully between the two of us, we'll, we'll answer whatever questions we have. I'm, I'm conscious we are we are on the top of the hour, so we might just uh, limit the number of questions. We, we might not be able to answer all of them. On, uh, you know, there's a few online already. Uh, 
we might actually start with something very easy. Um, <laughs> there was one question there. Um, obviously, the connection is France Ireland. Is it possible that that connection is used also for wider networks outside of France? Is it possible to export or import from other European markets? Uh, well, uh... I suppose by, by having the connection to France, France is already widely interconnected with the EU market. So the the power that we are going to receive in Ireland, although it's channeled through France, it could have originated in, in any of the interconnected states of, of which France is, is currently connected to. Um, for for Ireland, I mean, the, the, the transfer of power will go from Ireland to France when we have an excess of renewable generation and facilitate the EU target of achieving renewable, increased use of renewable energy. The power will flow from France to Ireland when there's a need for Ireland. We, we, we may have a condition where it's not a very windy day as it was traveling down from Dublin today. I, I didn't see very many of the turbines blowing today. So in situations like that, we will import power to meet and maintain our security of supply. Yeah. So I'll be a bit involved here. I think that's okay. okay. Um, there's a question from an electrical engineer side. Um, and it's whether for the communications across the fiber optic for switching because synchronization between switch gear, are you going to use the goose network? And I, for those that are preparing the question, uh, the abbreviation of goose means generic object oriented substation event. For the, are you using standard protocols? It's IEC, uh, what I'm saying, wrote it down, 61850. Are you using that? 61850. Um, that, that will be a, a design feature from Siemens Energy. So the, the control and the synchronization of the two converter stations uh, and in terms of how they speak to each other and, and uh, handle uh, effectively the commands from the National Control Center here in Ireland or the equivalent in France. Um, I do believe that they, the Siemens relays will, will be using 61A50 protocols. Um, but as I say, that will be a, a detailed design factor. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I didn't compare that earlier. That was just something that started to be on the spot. I have a little background in protection, so I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with it. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, there was one question, actually, on concern. You mentioned that you're going to bury it 1.5 meters deep. Uh, why not deeper? Is it enough? 1.5 meters deep in the marine environment. I mean, there will be areas where it is buried deeper. I suppose 1.5 is the, the minimum um, that we would seek. Um, there will be a post-lay surveys where we, you know, after the cable has been buried and the, the channel has been backfilled, we will do an assessment to see you know, have we achieved that target depth of, of burial? And if not, we will have to work with our contractor then to put in the correct protection for that cable to make sure that, you know, it isn't going to become exposed and uh, ultimately be, be exposed to damage in the future. And there was another question probably well ahead, but is this the only connection or is, is there a, a, a capacity uh, for the future in this project also addressed? For, for this project, um, the, I suppose symmetrical monopole schemes can be scalable. It, it's not been chosen for this application that it, it can be uh, operated in the future. I mean, it, it's a very interesting question because the demand for electricity is ever increasing. And there was a question put to the CEO last Friday at the event in Paris, you know, when, when will Celtic 2 be built? And the answer was just let us get into the water with this one first. <laughs> well, um, um, is there a lifetime uh, the expectancy on it? You know, in the sense that the cable is segregated over time or something like that. And is there a facility perhaps if the cable does break at some point that you can take it up? And sure, yeah. Well, I, do you mind if I just repeat the question in case anyone didn't hear it online? So the, the question was around the lifetime of the infrastructure and the ability to um, repair, I suppose, the cable, is it? Yeah, yeah. So there, there is a, a lifetime for the equipment. Um, for the converter station, we would need to replace control systems after a period of time. It's like 
any power electronic components, you know, your mobile phone, your laptop, um, they, those individual components have a lifetime. So after maybe 15, 20 years, we will do an upgrade of, of the control system to extend the lifetime of the interconnector. And that's something that can continue on. Um, the cables themselves, if, if nothing impacts on the cables, um, and they have been designed and installed correctly, operating within their thermal limits and their current ampacity capabilities. There's no reason um, why they shouldn't remain operational for over 40 years, maybe even, even longer. Um, should anything happen, there are um, facilities to be able to repair that cable. So the points where we have, I mean, one, one of the more likely locations for a failure would be the jointing location. So at those, at those locations, there is um, a methodology where the, the jointing would be laid in what's known as an omega configuration. So there's extended cabling uh, that would allow the, the uh, lifting of the cable from the seabed up onto a vessel, new section of cable put in, old section of cable cut away and, and new joints put in. So absolutely, again, it's complex arrangement, something that you don't necessarily want to be doing, but should it arise, yes, yeah, the, the lifetime can be extended or uh, issues or, or faults can be repaired. Well, let's take two more questions. There's one at the back of the room. Okay. Um, do we have any control on the uh, type of electricity coming from France? It could be mostly nuclear, yeah? Uh, well, Fran France has, sorry, just to repeat the question for, for online, is there any control over the type of electricity um, and whether it's it's predominantly nuclear? Um, look, France's generation mix uh, has nuclear contained within it, but France's uh, energy mix also contains energy from every state to which it is presently connected. So we cannot control, I suppose, the source of the energy that's coming through. Some of it will be nuclear. Um, Others will be renewable, others will be conventional plants, but it, it, it all forms part of the same energy mix. Do we see that we'll be exporting more than we'll be importing? Um, and will it mean that we can reduce our water stuff? Is it something we will need? Okay, so the question there was will we import or export more, and, and will it lead to a reduction in conventional plants, reliance on conventional plants? The, the, I mean, there, there's studies have been done um, to look at this and, and predominantly majority of the flow will be from Ireland to France. Um, it, it, it will change over time, depending on system conditions. Um, as I said, a facility is there for us to import and export. At the moment, we are limited in terms of the amount of renewable energy we can bring onto the system albeit we are world, world leaders in the amount that we can bring onto the system. So we have a very high, what's known as an SNSP level, synchronous, non-synchronous penetration. So up to 75% of our demand can be met by renewable sources at the moment. Having this interconnector available will allow the expansion and the increase of that percentage level, whereby we can allow more renewables onto the system. Um, does that answer your question? Fantastic. No way. It's a pedestrian question. What size did you convert it to? Okay. Could, you had it out there, but I couldn't read any dimensions. I think I've cut the dimensions off, but I, I think it's maybe about 80 meters by 150 meters, Shane, in terms of the, the property boundary fence. And what height? The height of the converter building, I, I, I regret not putting in the 3D graphic um, at the moment, but the, the height will be somewhere in the region of 18 to 20 meters at its highest point. The last one. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what's the efficiency of, of the transfer when you take into the tooling of the auxiliary services that are required? Okay, yeah, I mean, losses are a, a big, a big factor um, and it would have been one of the more important aspects of the specifications that we put out and incentivized in terms of the tendering process. So each converter station um, will have less than 1% of losses, um, which is, you know, we, we have contractual values, I suppose that I, I'm probably not privy to be able to say here, but it's less than 1%. For the uh, AC cable on the Irish side, we'll, we'll have about one megawatt of losses. And then over the DC component, there's about 20 megawatts of losses. So 
The 700 megawatts is measured at the receiving end. So in order for 700 megawatts to be received in France, we need to send 700 plus X. Uh, and that X is the loss factor, let's say. So less than 1% per station, 20 megawatts then for the DC cable and one megawatt for the AC cable. It, it, it's vastly improved in terms of the, the modular multi-level converter. So you, you're not switching the IGBTs as much in the pulse width modulation. And that switching process generates a lot of the losses. You're, you're switching um, smaller voltage gradients uh, less often. So modular multi-level converters have reduced the loss factor compared to the step, the two-step and the three-step converters. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we have to cut it short. We don't want to be uh, taking all of your time. Thank you very much for uh, allocating as much as you could. And uh, My pleasure.